Hello, and welcome to this video dealing with what is AWS Lambda. Now, in this video topic, we're going to go ahead and discuss a few different things. It's really going to provide you a high level explanation over fundamentals within AWS Lambda. And then we're also going to talk about how it works. We're going to be covering a few different concepts within this topic. It's going to include what Lambda is and what it is not, what it does and how it does it, configuration, and then language support within Lambda. So let's go ahead and get started and we'll click on next here. And the first thing we're going to see is what is Lambda? AWS Lambda is a serverless compute platform that essentially allows you to run code without having to manage or provision any underlying servers. With this being said, that means your primary focus is only on your code. You only need to update and manage your code itself. AWS actually handles all infrastructure and compute resources within the background, so you don't have to worry about that. It's more of a zero administration approach, and you give up a little bit of flexibility in this aspect because you cannot manage any of the underlying resources. And then lastly, it is event driven. Now this is a key fundamental, and we'll discuss this later on in serverless fundamentals, but it's event driven, which means your code is only executing when it's being triggered. A major benefit of this is the fact that you're only getting billed for what you actually consume within compute time. So if you're only running for one and a half seconds, you're only going to get billed for that one and a half seconds. Now, if this is your first time getting into Lambda, I do recommend going over here to the AWS Lambda screen, the introduction screen that is, where there's an overview, features, pricing, things like that to really get you started and get a good foundation outside of this course when you want to get started. Now, back over here on the graph, you can see I actually clipped in an example function. Now, this is just a basic hello world Lambda function that AWS actually provides us to get you going a little bit faster. And you can really see how simple these functions can really be. It literally just reads and then prints out a couple key values. So you're probably saying, Andrew, that's nice and all right, but what can't I do with it? Well, if you need to manage your resources, your underlying compute resources, Lambda is not for you. It's not perfect for all application needs necessarily. If you need to manage something like the compute and all the other underlying resources, you might look at EC2 or maybe Elastic Beanstalk. Other than that, Lambda is a good fit for a lot of different application resources and a lot of different backend services. So continuing on, we'll go ahead and go to the next page, which is how Lambda works its magic. A key concept for how Lambda works so well is that it does utilize this event driven architecture. And by event driven, I mean anytime an event happens within your environment, which is a change in your environment, your function is then going to be executed by AWS Lambda. Now all of these functions are actually executed on AWS EC2 and container services. You just don't get a chance to look at them or interact with them. Another reason that Lambda works so well is because the workloads and the functions that you create, they need to be stateless. Now, when I say stateless, I mean you're not saving any information within the Lambda function itself. If you need to save stateful data, you're going to use a more of a stateful service, something like S3, DynamoDB, things of that nature. When you create these functions to be stateless, it allows Lambda to rapidly scale for you automatically. So you can see here like this diagram, if it's getting a ton of different invoke calls, it's going to automatically scale out to meet that demand. Okay, so what's the catch? What are you responsible for, right? Well, you're responsible for a few things. Your code itself, defining memory allocation, and when you define memory, you have a minimum of 128 megabytes and then a maximum of 3,008 megabytes. And anytime you want to change in between the minimum and maximum, you have to make increments of 64 megabytes. Then the last thing you're responsible for that's key is setting execution timeouts. So you can set your execution timeout from one second all the way up to 300 seconds, which is five minutes. Okay, so what is AWS responsible for then? Well, that's a good question. AWS is responsible for a few different things. The first thing is high availability and fault tolerance. And what I mean by this is AWS is redundantly running your code in the background. So you're going to be running in multiple AZs. You just don't get a chance to interact with that or see that. And then also from the fault tolerance perspective, your code that is stored, you see it in just one place, a region, but AWS is actually redundantly storing that code in the background for you. Then they also deal with the compute and operating system maintenance. So any patching or underlying hardware maintenance is all handled by them. This falls back to that zero administration that we talked about earlier. AWS also handles a few of the normal day-to-day -day compute resources like CPU power, networking bandwidth, and then disk input output. This is all underlying infrastructure, so you don't deal with it. Now, a little tip for CPU is that 
your CPU power is actually proportional to the memory allocated to your function. And what I mean by that is laid out in this example below. A function that has 2048 megabytes assigned to it for allocated memory will have 16 times the CPU share as 128 megabytes. And that's a pretty simple calculation. You just take 2048 divided by 128 and you get 16. Now this can really help with decreasing start times and increasing efficiency. Just understand if you set your memory allocation higher, you could get billed for that if you do in fact use it. And the last thing we have here is code monitoring and logging. Now AWS Lambda will automatically handle code monitoring and logging, which is interacting with CloudWatch. This is nice because it's usable by you in the future if you need to check out some logs or other type of monitoring metrics. Before we go to the next page, let's go and check out the Lambda Management Console. So when you go to AWS Lambda, the first time you're gonna get an introductory screen. Now, I didn't get it in this video because I've already been playing around in Lambda, but when you do see it, you're gonna be given different links for API references, documentation, use cases, things like that. When you progress past that, you're gonna to come to a dashboard. Now this shows my resources for US East One, which is North Virginia. And you can see from an overview, I have seven Lambda functions, two and a half kilobytes of storage, and then a thousand full account concurrency left. Now I just wanted to get you a sneak peek and get you comfortable with the dashboard. So when we come back to it later, you kind of understand what's going on. And then here on the left, you can see we have functions. Now functions is gonna take you to your list of functions that you have created. Now you can see I have several already listed because I've been playing around with some, and there are a few key elements to this page. You can see the function name, the description, the runtime, the code size, and then when the code was last modified. So let's go ahead and continue over here, back to the graph, and we'll continue on. The next page is supported languages. Now AWS does support many of the most popular programming languages, and those can be seen here below. We have Node.js, Java, Python, C Sharp, and then Go, which was a newer addition pretty recently. Now underneath all of these, you can see all of the respective versions that are supported by Lambda currently. And if we click on each logo here, we get a list of the libraries that are by default supported with AWS Lambda. Now most of them are going to be SDKs, and then some actually don't even exist, such as Go at this time. Now this is liable to change because AWS does move quickly, but at the time of recording, there are no default libraries supported. So continuing on to the next page, we get Lambda building blocks. Now, what are Lambda building blocks? Lambda building blocks are essential to Lambda functions in AWS Lambda as a whole. No matter what you do, you will always have the same functional building blocks within your function. You'll have your Lambda function, which is the foundation of your application. It's the code itself. You have an event source, which is a trigger for invoking your functions, which we'll discuss a little bit later on. You have downstream resources, which could be anything from CloudWatch to other AWS services, such as S3. You have log streams, which are within CloudWatch, and then you have AWS SAM, which is the AWS model used to define serverless architecture. It's the serverless application model. Now, AWS does provide a few tools for creation and testing of your functions. You have the Lambda console, which is over here on the left, AWS CLI, which there's a snippet down here on the bottom, and then SAM local, which is actually beta right now. Now, moving on to the next slide, we have the programming model. So the programming model is really the similar pattern that your function code will always follow, regardless of the language that you use. The first thing listed, which is the most important in my opinion, is the handler. Now, this is the function within your code that Lambda actually invokes. And you can see a Python example pictured here where the handler is called my handler. And then we're passing in two different parameters. There's an event object and a context object. Now the event object is used to pass in event data from other AWS services. And then the context object, which we described down here, the second thing listed is the second parameter and it allows your code to interact with Lambda. Now, when I say interact with Lambda, I mean you can pull different information about your request, such as the request ID, the duration that your function ran, different things like that. And then you can see here that returning values is optional. And in this snippet, we do return a value of expected value as the variable. And if you take a look at this little handler context examples button, I actually provide different handler examples with context objects in there for all of the different languages. If you get some time, I recommend you check this page out. I kind of lay out the different examples per language on how the handler is defined and then how you pass in different objects. But for now, we're gonna go back to the previous page and continue on. The next thing we see is logging. Now Lambda will always log your function and you can actually customize these logs using logging statements such as logger within Python or maybe a print statement. 
but by default, Lambda is going to write logs to CloudWatch. You can just customize how detailed you really wanna get with those logs. An important thing to keep in mind is that the defaults for logging are gonna be slightly different per language. So make sure you read the documentation for your language. And then lastly, we have function errors. Now function errors are where Lambda is going to recognize code failures and return exceptions. You can create custom error handling within your code if you want or utilize defaults. Mm -hmm.